oxygen, if the batteries will be applicable or not. But when you look at it from the application point of view, there are multiple parameters such as cycle life, energy density, which will determine the footprint, size of the technology, uh, the charge discharge rate. So all these parameters together. So when we evaluate technologies for different applications, uh, we evaluate them on uh, eight different parameters, uh, which includes also parameters like safety, which should be very crucial. Uh, and then according to that, uh, right technology can be chosen. Uh, the way we are seeing right now the world, uh, there is a definitely lithium-ion battery chemistries are getting a lot of attention. Right now, there is somewhere around 350 gigawatt hour of annual manufacturing capacity, uh, which is uh, already getting operational uh, as of end of this year, uh, which is uh, both applications for uh, mobility as well as for stationary storage. Uh, but uh, already there are announcements which uh, put the lithium-ion battery manufacturing for 2025 at around 1500 gigawatt hour. Uh, even India is looking at setting up around 50 gigawatt hour of advanced chemistry cell manufacturing by that time. Uh, so lithium-ion battery chemistries are definitely taking lead, but I wouldn't rule out other chemistries. We as an India Energy Storage Alliance have a very active program in supporting startups and early stage companies where we are uh, helping all these other chemistries as well. So, uh, uh, Mr. Rahul, do you, do you see, like I said, right, so, uh, and you rightly mentioned the capital cost is one of the major factors is the headline kind of a cost that goes into determining whether the batteries are viable or not. But of course, there's a life cycle cost. And I'll, I'll go to Mr. Parimal to discuss that. But, uh, you know, as you know, the costs have been dramatically coming down, right? And uh, especially the installation cost, the capital cost is coming down. Um, and we believe it is coming down faster than it was expected uh, two years back, maybe. So, right now, so is, and, and different types of chemistries, uh, you know, they have different costs, uh, upfront cost, and all of them are coming down. So, uh, the question here is, are we looking at a convergence in the future? Or do you think they will continue to be multiple, uh, you know, chemistries evolving together for different applications? Uh, so, we see there will be multiple chemistries will continue to evolve uh, because again, now uh, when you look at only the capital cost, then some technologies definitely are becoming more dominant, uh, especially the lithium-ion battery chemistries. Uh, but when you consider the levelized cost or the total cost of ownership, uh, there are again certain applications where, for example, utilities are saying that they would prefer technologies which can have 25, 30 year of uh, life. And there, in fact, there are even uh, beyond electro chemical batteries there are even chemistries uh, based on uh, uh, gravity based uh, uh, storage uh, not just pumped hydro but other forms of gravity based storage uh, uh, thermal storage or electrochemical uh, electrothermal storage uh, so multiple such uh, uh, opportunities are being seen uh, uh, for those so uh, we think uh, there will be certain dominant chemistries like for example lead acid uh, batteries have dominated the world for more than 150 years. So similarly, at least next 20 years, uh, lithium-ion batteries or newer versions of lithium-ion batteries such as solid-state batteries or uh, lithium-sulfur batteries, which are again part of the lithium-ion chemistry, uh, those will uh, uh, continue to dominate. But uh, there are uh, specific applications where metal-air batteries or other chemistry of batteries like sodium-based batteries, they may also find uh, applications. I see. Um, so, coming back to the question of uh, levelized cost of energy, right? Uh, um, Mr. Parimal, I would like to know and uh, understand from you, uh, as a developer, you know that there's been a recent uh, bit where the government has asked for sort of an RTC power from uh, renewable energy sources. Um, so, and in that case, obviously, a key role will be played by uh, battery uh, strategies and battery technologies. And we've seen the, the levelized cost of energy is still very, very high, right? Uh, we've got the beta of around six rupees to seven rupees. Um, so as a developer, Mr. Parimal, what do you think, uh, uh, when will you see, a kind, or when you expect to see over the next few years, uh, the battery prices uh, as a levelized cost of uh, energy, uh, battery prices uh, going towards closer to let's say, a you know, RTC thermal power of, let's say, 4 rupees, 4 rupees, 30 paisa. Are we getting close to that? Are we, uh, you know, moving in that direction? How many years will it take for us to, to say, okay, now renewable energy plus storage is almost at par without any incentives, almost at par with, uh, with, with let's say, a base load thermal energy? Uh, hi, Rahul. Uh, now, let us try to understand what does that 
RTC mean? Actually, mm -hmm. there are various connotations to RTC. Uh, the extreme variety of RTC is that as soon as I press my switch, the lights would get switched on or fan should get switched on. So on demand, okay? So that, that is the most difficult kind of thing, RTC, which is very difficult for any renewable power plant uh, married with storage to give. So this means that you would have to have uh, too much of storage to take care of all kind of variabilities in the, in the, in the weather. So if you are asking for that kind of RTC, the storage cost will go dramatically up. And therefore, mm, those kind of numbers which you said uh, is, is, is there six rupees, seven rupees, etc. If it is another kind of RTC where I give what I promise, where this means that whatever I have scheduled, I will definitely give you. So that is a separate kind of an RTC. There, your uh, you need slightly lower storage. So there, at, um, there the cost will be lower. Ultimately, the cost of RTC power is nothing but weighted average cost of direct power renewable, which is going in the grid, and plus the power which passes through the storage device. The storage device, the power which passes through storage device may cost you significantly higher, maybe at least 10, 11 cents or something of that kind. So art is how to balance the ratio between the power which is going directly without any storage device and uh, what is going through storage device. So um, this depends on the bid. Some of the bid conditions are very tough where it is practically on demand kind of thing. I, I press the button when I ask you, you must generate which coal fired power plants can do easily or gas fired power plant can do easily. In case of storage-based uh, renewable power plants, you have to have a lot of storage. Uh, so right now, even if you take $250 per kWh all-in cost plus taxes, now taxes are very high. You have high import duty and you have 18% GST. So the whole thing has, if you are marrying it with solar, you will have to bring down the GST to 5%, similar to what is there in the case of solar. And similarly, the import duty has to be brought in, uh, brought down significantly. So unless these two things uh, are brought down and the cost of the storage technology itself comes down significantly from, say, $250 uh, dollar basic to, say, $150 dollar basic, I don't think on-demand RTC will be viable for, on an IPP kind of a stuff. Uh, but but some different variety of RTC, yes. Yeah, no, no, you're you're right. So uh, we do see, and and uh, Mr. Walgolka, correct correct me if I'm wrong. We do see prices moving towards more of 170, 180 dollars. Uh, um, you know, in the near future, or maybe you know, even currently, some of the sourcing that I have come across, they are around for 160, 170. So if uh, are we likely to hit uh, these prices anytime soon? Actually, I would like to take the discussion on a different direction. I think this is something, I think these price points and this expectation is actually killing the industry or it is preventing industries to take off. Right now in India, we have more than 80, 90 gigawatt of diesel generators installed. Again, not all of them are operating continuously, but there is somewhere around 5 to 10% of those diesel generators are being used more than 1,000 hours, where it is costing customers anywhere from 14 rupees to 18 rupees per kilowatt hour. So just the expectation that we need to have RE plus storage coming at 4 rupees or below 4 rupees is itself is not required. And as a load weighted, uh, the contract which was won by Renew for uh, 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 with Seki tender, uh, that has a load weighted price for 6 hour guaranteed peak price deliverability of 4 rupees 30 paise. So the price is already very well acceptable. Uh, the other side is that when again when you look at these prices, uh, one of the things which will happen is uh, we are anticipate a big adoption happening on the behind the meter side. Because right now, if you see, even I think uh, maybe the residential customers, at least in Maharashtra, who are staying home and consuming more than 500 units per month, are paying a tariff of more than 10 rupees to MSCB. 
similarly, uh, uh, especially commercial industrial customers are paying that price. So even if at a rooftop solar plus storage comes at six rupees, seven rupees, that is something which is a straight saving right now for the customer. So I don't think we need to wait for any more price reductions uh, because again, as we have seen with solar, the cost reduction of solar has not happened just because of the panel prices have come down. Uh, 10 years back, uh, the share of panel prices versus the rest of the system cost was also different. Also, the way the project optimization happens, it is different. So I think we are way late right now. Uh, we need to actually start getting these deployments. And uh, as the deployment scales up, the prices will continue to come down. I'm not saying that prices will not come down. That trend is there. But I think we have already, maybe two years back, reached a price par parity where we should be deploying a lot more uh, such hybrid projects in India than what we have been doing right now. For example, last five years, we are talking about Andaman Nicobar with 70 uh, uh, megawatt of diesel generators powering entire island and polluting uh, with an average cost of around 28 to 30 rupees per kilowatt hour. Now, even five years back with the storage price and solar price, what it was, it was cost effective to replace those uh, diesel generators. Uh, so we need to focus on these type of applications and do it rather than waiting for prices to come down for everyone. It's excellent. So I think this uh, this sets up uh, very nicely for, and, and I uh, you're right, uh, I think the discussion on price is uh, critical. However, it's not the only driving point. So I would like to ask then, uh, you know, Mr. Nishit from Sterlite Power. Um, you know, there are, uh, like Rahul said, right, there are various... large-scale adoption. We've not really seen a large-scale adoption of uh, storage technologies in the grid. Um, you are in the forefront. You've submitted a grid uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, so you know, tell us, what, what do you feel are the challenges uh, of this large-scale adoption uh, in the in the grid storage? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the <laughs> Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, yeah, so I would uh, kind of start off by saying that I'll restrict my answer to the grid scale applications because as Rahul mentioned, there are a number of applications beyond the grid as well and closer to the consumer. Um, and, and generally speaking, the value of the application goes on increasing the closer and closer you get to the customer. Um, so I, I kind of restrict my uh, answer to grid scale applications. If you look at grid scale applications of energy storage, there's broadly three categories uh, of, of applications. Um, and these categories basically vary by duration of storage required and the rate at which the storage needs to be charged or discharged. Um, and I'll go by uh, value in terms of which are the most immediate uh, applications that make more the most immediate sense commercially uh, where the value is large and move on to uh, the others where the value might be a little lower uh, per unit but the volume required will be uh, pretty pretty high. So the first application that comes to mind uh, is frequency regulation. Uh, and this is something that uh, if you see globally as well, is the first application that gets addressed and saturated in any uh, market for energy storage. Uh, and this comes from, as everybody understands, uh, the frequency deviation uh, that happens in the grid. Uh, and in India, especially, this is a concern with uh, the average monthly FDI uh, in India being outside the IETC band for more than 20% of the time consistently. And on some days, it is outside of the band for more than 50% of the 24 hours in a day or 96 time blocks. Uh, so this is a pressing immediate concern for the uh, uh, Indian grid. Uh, today, it is addressed uh, in uh, not directly uh, through a frequency regulation market, which is under uh, uh, the works, uh, but indirectly through DSM, etc., uh, where we, we address it through these different uh, methods. So if we, if we consider the frequency regulation kind of application, that itself is a 2 to 3 gigawatt requirement of uh, battery energy storage capacity or any uh, energy storage capacity that could fulfill these requirements. Uh, once we move beyond frequency regulation, uh, next most immediate requirement would be from a ramping perspective, uh, especially as India moved towards uh, 175 gigawatt uh, uh, total renewable uh, uh, installed capacity. 
you and given the intermittent nature of the renewables, especially the solar duck curve uh, in the evening times, uh, the ramping requirements becomes severe, uh, especially when you compare that with the remaining resources that we have on the grid, which are uh, thermal plants, uh, which don't move that quickly uh, in response to ramping requirements. And so uh, ramping is, um, you call it resource advocacy, call it ramping, call it, there's a number of different things that you could call it. Uh, that's the second um, broad bucket that I would classify as being a big grid requirement. And then third is uh, the, the biggest volume uh, of energy storage that will be required in the coming five years uh, and more and beyond will be the peak shifting aspect, which uh, a couple of uh, people have already alluded to. And that's what the RTC genders are all about. Just basically taking, taking the generation peak of the afternoon and shifting it to the demand peak, uh, which is in the evening. Uh, and this is done not just for utilizing more and more renewable power, but also for the existing thermal uh, units. Uh, these will quickly be suffering uh, steadily decreasing uh, CUFs or uh, capacity utilization factors, as you can already see. Uh, and the CEA report that was put out on this predicted that this would go down to 26% at the rate at which if nothing changes, and if we have 175 gigawatts by 22, 23, uh, that's, that's a really... Uh, alarming state of affairs for even the thermal industry and so for all of these reasons both for the increasing use of renewables as well as for sustainable uh, continuance of the thermal uh, generation we will need energy storage resources that can move the peak from the uh, afternoon generation peak to the evening demand peak so these are the broadly the applications uh, with regards to the second piece of your question around the challenges I think uh, the first challenge uh, and, and the most important is something that Rahul uh, very uh, beautifully responded to is the perception of energy storage uh, and the, the discussion being centered around the cost or capex cost of energy storage without really talking about what are the overall cost benefit analysis by application uh, that you're considering for. Not all applications are equal, not all applications generate the same value uh, and you shouldn't treat energy storage as a, you know, one built-in cost and, and apply it across all applications. So really changing that perception of just talking about cost to going to uh, doing a full cost benefit analysis and talking about what that is. And the second piece around that is really uh, an improvement in the data available at the grid level, at uh, nodal points on the grid to analyze what the requirements are at any given point in that grid, uh, over the next one, two, five, and in some countries it's done for the next 20 years. You've got integrated resource plans that happen in different countries for 20 years that are, that are built from very granular data from the bottom up. Now, uh, we need to start moving in that direction of, of the data is available. It's just being able to get gather that in a central place and being made it, make, making it available to the industry to be able to do the analyses and come back and say, okay, here are the points in the grid that really uh, have the most value for energy storage. And here's the cost benefit analysis. And then it's a straightforward discussion. It doesn't matter what the capex is as long as the cost benefit comes out positive. So uh, if, if that is an issue, what are the uh, you know, business models or economic models uh, that could be deployed even, even today, right? Whatever the analysis we have and the data that we've studied, uh, what do you suggest are, from a grid perspective, what are the kinds of uh, business models that could be deployed? Um, where is it supposed to be located? Who owns it? Who operates it? You know, how are the developers or you know, owners compensated? Which models do you think will work uh, going forward? Yeah, yeah, I think that there are a number of uh, business models that you see around the world uh, on this, uh, uh, beginning with the most prevalent at the grid scale, which is the generation coupled business model, where storage is coupled with generation. Uh, at the generation point. Uh, there's the storage as a standalone asset where it is uh, deployed anywhere on the grid, any point on the grid that uh, you can have in addition to uh, the usual applications that I mentioned, you can have additional applications uh, or additional value generated from the locational benefit of storage. So there are certain stressed points on the grid where you might be needing to uh, upgrade the infrastructure or invest capex in uh, relieving those stress points where storage could come in and defer that investment at a fraction of the cost. Uh, and so, so 
there's uh, storage as a standalone business model as well. And then there's, uh, at, at the grid scale, there's the storage as a merchant asset business model, which really relies on the presence of mature, deep markets around frequency regulation, around capacity, or even around energy, real-time markets. Uh, so these are typically markets that uh, in uh, the more developed countries you see are uh, deep and provide a, a mature enough revenue stream for developers to factor those in and hence reduce the cost of the primary application of storage. So these are broadly the three business models at the grid stage. Uh, obviously, as you go towards the more uh, consumer level applications of storage, the business models would change dramatically. Uh, but I'd like to restrict uh, my response to the, the grid, grid scale piece. And then within that, I think the answer for India, uh, in our view, is it, it will be a mix of all of the above, especially the generation coupled as well as uh, the standalone storage model. Uh, the merchant model, yes, uh, I think um, as our markets mature, as some of the markets that the CERC, etc. have planned are in the works, the frequency regulation, etc. come in, that those will play an increasingly a bigger role. But to begin with, I think uh, uh, we, we would be do good by ourselves to consider both business models, both generation as coupled as well as standalone, uh, which I don't feel is happening at the moment in our country. I feel like uh, a lot of the uh, attention is given to the generation coupled model uh, mm. is primarily because a substantial amount of the global deployment of storage has occurred under this model. And there's a very simple reason for that. Uh, most of this deployment has happened in the US. And in the US, because of a freak of the way that they've designed their subsidy program, storage gets a 30% CapEx subsidy if it is coupled with generation. And so you see a majority of the deployment in the US, the multi uh, 100 gigawatt, uh, uh, megawatt, sorry, applications that you see uh, that announced in the US are primarily generation coupled for that very reason. But you see more and more uh, the benefits of the standalone system and the additional benefits that it can uh, gather, as I mentioned, from a locational benefits perspective, as well as from a dispatch perspective. Uh, there are a couple of advantages of having a standalone asset, both from a business model perspective, as well as from a location uh, and value stacking benefit. Uh, I'll just mention three. One is, like I mentioned, the location benefits. Uh, you can locate it at whatever point on the grid generates maximum value and hence unlock additional value uh, from the same storage asset. So that's one. Second is a broader stacking of multiple applications. When you have storage at a couple just at the generation level, you get you restrict, you restrict yourself to the applications uh, that would benefit or uh, work in complement to the generator's um, requirements. Uh, or if you, let's say, for example, do a DC coupling, which is generally another uh, cost benefit of doing generation couple storage, you then restrict it to your size of the inverter or the size of your uh, uh, connection POC. Uh, and, and the applications that you can do on that storage are limited. Then. When you have a standalone asset, it can be dispatched by a central entity like a load dispatch center, either at the state level, regional level, or national level. And that central dispatcher can stack on applications, multiple applications, much better than any individual party can for the uh, maximum benefit of, uh, of the system. Uh, so, and, and that also translates into a funding aspect where you can have a, an EOD model which, uh, which is a fixed tolling based agreement uh, where the, the dispatcher gets to use the storage asset as they see fit for whatever application they see fit within the parameters of a fixed tolling model. And, and then that on the financing side uh, reduces the cost of financing as well because once you start having a consistent predictable revenue stream as opposed to a volume based revenue stream for a storage asset, you reduce the risk of your cash flows in the future and reducing your cost of debt as much as 100 basis point from our experience uh, in the US. Uh, and that dramatically uh, makes storage even more affordable for these applications. Excellent point. I think, uh, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the value of, uh, you know, storage possibly lies in our ability to uh, stack multiple, um, you know, utilities and applications for the same battery, right? I think if you're able to do that, that the, the discussion on the cost will possibly change to the benefit, right? And then it will be a much more favorable uh, cost benefit benefit analysis. Uh, moving on from, from grid to, let's say, off grid, right? Um, um, and Mr. Kushagran, and then you, you have a large experience in in uh, off grid solutions. So 
tell us what is your perspective um, in terms of major applications of battery storage technology for off grid uh, purposes dist distributed energy storage for example right uh, what is the need of battery storage in uh, in such applications and uh, you know how how do you think it will possibly benefit the end end consumer to what extent it will benefit and where do you see the industry right now please uh thank you sir uh, can you guys hear me yeah we can hear you Good. So I think uh, let me start with a comment which uh, Dr. Rahul has mentioned that uh, we are already seeing there are niche, niche applications including Andaman. In fact, uh, we uh, are working on a project across four islands in Lakshadweep, and those four islands are currently powered by uh, diesel. And the cost, uh, not only the government is subsidizing the transport cost of the diesel. But also the distribution cost of power from uh, the diesel generation, uh, uh, how the power happens over there, or generation happens over there. So over uh, so across these four islands, we are not only installing solar, but also integrating storage along with diesel, and that power will be distributed, uh, and the government will be and the, uh, the investment is done by Solar Energy Corporation of India. We are implementing the project, designing it, and maintaining it for next ten years, and underwriting the performance of the project. So those are the niche applications, and including uh, looking at few projects in Andaman, and there are certain applications we are already looking at uh, certain army bases, forward army bases, uh, which are powered by diesel overall, and northeast uh, uh, in Himalayan terrain. And uh, uh, so there are already those type of applications where uh, storage along with solar is already making a lot of sense. Uh, we are already seeing the storage cost uh, coming down. Uh, uh, as I think uh, a few speakers have already mentioned about it, but what we are seeing is as long as uh, uh, there are other technologies along with, uh, in, in addition to NMC or LFP, uh, there are certain chemistries from uh, zinc are also coming in. Uh, those can actually uh, uh, underwrite for more than 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And so with those coming in and the price coming down, uh, we see multiple applications coming in. Uh, so we are at the forefront of on the integration business where we are understanding looking at multiple uh, technologies we're looking at what is the end use of it and then designing a solution around it so as we have implemented uh, multiple projects across 24 states in the country so we are looking at those problem statements uh, and picking up those projects especially in for example maharashtra where the electricity tariffs are very very high for certain commercial segment, in fact, more than 12, 14 uh, rupees in certain cases. So there are cases over there, it is making a lot of sense at, at the today's cost levels. And if you project it out for a year, two weeks, not basically not a five year plan. So we are already seeing that we can deploy in hundreds of megawatt hours, these applications. So we are already now working out with, uh, because we do a lot of PPA projects on our own balance sheet, the commercial industrial application on the solar projects. So we are looking at few projects, integrating storage, and then offering it as on a PP or a lease basis. So, uh, so there is a lot of innovation which is happening on the integration side of it. When you understand from the systems uh, perspective, and then plug it with, plug it with the financial offerings which can come in. So, uh, and we are looking at batteries coming in from a twenty-year design life perspective, right? And then uh, there are multiple approaches how you design a system. And then there's a lot of innovation, not only happening from a storage perspective, but on the inverter or PCU perspective as well, because uh, how you drive more efficiencies out of the system. So uh, from our perspective, we are seeing multiple niches are coming in and already uh, there are uh, uh, opportunities coming in. For example, as a country is moving towards time of the use, uh, where the night power is cheaper than the data uh, time. So there are a few clients of ours. They are, they are asking, can you just install storage at our premises? We will uh, charge our batteries from a lower tariff at the night time and then use it in the daytime onwards. So uh, I think those type of opportunities are starting to come in and we'll see more and more of those deployments will have to come in. And I think the utilities will have to get ready for what is coming in because they have only seen what solar can do for them. I think they will have to look at from a perspective when the solar and storage comes along. I think we have to get ready for uh, uh, from uh, from that perspective as well. No, that's right. I, I, and that's what we were getting at. Um, you know, we were discussing with uh, Parimalji earlier that we see we, we see uh, some bit of uh, you know application of storage at a large scale, anyways, right? Uh, and we've seen that bid from uh, from the government. 
um, you know, where people have to participate using an energy storage and and, and renewable power, right? So combination of these two, um, you know, as, as and when it becomes completely, uh, you know, uh, equated with the grid at the cost there, I think it will see a large, possibly a large uh, application. Do you see, uh, Kushagra, do you, do you see a, a significant demand so we are talking about a 50 gigawatt hour kind of a manufacturing space, and I will go to manufacturing in a little bit. But just sure. so you are here right now, and you are saying there are a lot of niche applications that you are seeing, and there is a lot of demand coming. Do you see a significant component of the battery storage in India, uh, the application of that in these niche areas behind the meter kind of uh, applications? Do you see a large component, like a 20, 30 percent of that, coming in from these areas? So, uh, I'll go with the data. Good question, actually. How I'll go with the data again with uh, Rahul mentioned that there is already a genset installed capacity of close to 80 to 100 gigawatts. And what we understand between 10 and 20 gigawatt is some uh, mostly operational type of it. If you think about the placement of that, right, and uh, so the number starts becoming uh, uh, making a lot of sense. And then if you plug it with uh, your dollar prices is reaching between 120, 150 dollars per kilowatt hour in next two to three years uh, installed basis. Then you're looking at a multiple fold jump from a manufacturing perspective. Achieving those kind of numbers are actually mind blogging. But if you look at deep dive, this starts making sense. Uh, from our perspective, what we're seeing is uh, there are clients which we are in a discussions. Uh, single installed base, 10 megawatt hour, 20 megawatt hour. Uh, uh, so there are those niches which are starting to a single locations, uh, but there are multiple of those we are currently under discussions which are 1 megawatt hour, 2 megawatt hour, 3 megawatt hour discussions. So, uh, they, uh, it has started to have that and then you bring it as the industry or the financial industry and, uh, has become comfortable financing uh, solar PPAs, right? You will see once the financial industry starts becoming comfortable with the storage PPAs, you will see that numbers jumping very, very quickly. And uh, we see uh, that should start coming in in another two to three years because it has already started happening uh, in developed markets either in Europe or in the US. Uh, and, uh, and over there, the commercial PPAs are starting to happen. Utility scale PPAs are already happening on the storage piece of it. So uh, the numbers are starting to make sense. Very interesting. Um, and and if you if you look at the applications now, right? We're talking about grid storage. We're talking about off grid and these these niche uh, behind the meter kind of applications. And, and the, one of the most important and possibly you know most widely talked about application is uh, electric vehicles. Um, so I'd like to bring in uh, Mr. Gill and talk about uh, you know some of the challenges. This has been talked about enough, but I would still like to understand his perspective on um, uh, on the challenges faced by the two-wheeler EV industry, what is the uh, likely growth of this two-wheeler industry? And specifically speaking, uh, do you see battery as a as a major playing a major role in in these challenges, right? Um, and and what do you think will be the operating model when it comes to battery for uh, for a two-wheeler electric vehicle market to develop uh, over the next few years? Yeah, Saurabh. Uh... Like we are all used to such a great uh, petrol side uh, motorcycles and scooters for the last 40 years now that uh, when you introduce electric vehicles and customers walks in, he likes uh, performance which is similar to the one he is used to in case of a, like a Hero Pleasure or an Activa or any other such vehicle, right? So, so that type of a performance, if we want to give it to electric vehicle and one of our company, sister company, Hero, is trying to do for Aether, then that price becomes exorbitant for a customer, uh, which is upwards of 1.3 lakhs or something. And although he likes the two-wheeler, but he doesn't buy any. The main part of that is also the battery. Because as you go for a higher performance, 70 kilometers per hour, long range type of a vehicle, you need upwards of 3 kilowatt hour batteries over there in lithium, right? And the replacement cost, if he asks the question, it is so frightening for the customer that, okay, first time I will pay 130,000, but the next time I'll have to pay 60,000 rupees for a replacement cost of that, it's equal to the cost of an Activa. So it doesn't make sense for anybody to buy that type of a vehicle, even if there is a TCO intangible advantage, which in a way they don't calculate it the way we tell them. They say, if I buy for 70,000, I have another 70,000, 80,000 to take care of TCO advantage, even the TCO is not there. Therefore, 
the time has not come for equal performing two wheelers yet and that's why most of the people have started coming down to uh, mid speed type of vehicles which need much lesser batteries and which have lesser motor powers but then there is a compromise between the performance which is aspirant to the customer and the actual on road so these vehicles go at 40 50 kilometers per hour and they have a range of uh, something like 50 kilometers although it fits well into indian conditions because city speeds or road speeds are not more than 30 40 kilometers per hour and range required in a two wheeler is not at all more than 30 40 kilometers especially with all the batteries being portable now with these two wheelers and they are 1.4 kilowatt hour battery weighing around 10 kg which can be okay with some difficulty carried home and charged like a mobile so it fits very well into this uh, but if these vehicles today have to get a subsidy then there is a limitation of eligibility of a range on that which is 80 kilometers minimum to give 80 kilometer necessarily one has to put more number of batteries in that also in this 40 kilometer speed vehicle and once you once you start putting a higher capacity batteries which is upwards of 2 kilowatt hour or something the same uh, effect sets in from a customer mindset okay not 60000 but i'll have to pay 40000 for a replacement battery so both these are sort of start of a uh, from a fee point of view or a subsidy point of view they are non starters that is why the net effect of that is we have seen in the last one and a half years the fee m2 has totally collapsed and there has been no subsidy really more than 16000 vehicles have not been subsidized so in case we are able to find a solution till the time battery prices come down we have to find a solution of uh, removing the range criteria from this and making it as a choice of customer if you want a 40 50 km range speed should be there but the range can be reduced perhaps this uh, there will be an explosion of demand because the replacement cost of batteries will be then 25000 or so which is okay after 3 years another thing in the battery is because as you go up higher in performance obviously number of batteries go up or a higher capacity go up the cycle life is still predetermined from a user of a two wheeler with the road condition and temperature conditions of a battery so we are not talking of anything more than for example 1000 cycle life on a practical road condition on a pack level now this 1000 cycle is not understood by the customer he says give me number of years mm-hmm. and in number of years nobody has a sort of a risk appetite to give more than a 3 years warranty on a bat so imagine the customer thinks that in any case after 3 years i have to replace a battery costing 60000 why should i buy or if i am not even getting a subsidy on a vehicle why should i buy so that's why we are caught into a vicious cycle where the volumes of subsidized vehicles have gone down and the volumes of non subsidized vehicles which are sort of 40 km 30 km per hour 50 km have dramatically increased so it, it is uh, against the policies of the government so that's where we keep fighting with the government that if you want to really replace an electric two wheeler don't think of uh, creating an equal performing two wheeler think of a the one which mobility solution is fulfilled by the customer the road conditions ke hisab se temperatures ke hisab se give a battery which has a good life which is not more than 30% of the cost of the vehicle then only it will explode otherwise not interesting um also from a from a consumer of uh, you know batteries uh, as a procurer of batteries uh, what do you think mr gill how critical is it to develop uh, you know a domestic manufacturing base you talked about cost right and until we find a solution to the cost it is uh, the only thing that can work is possibly a subsidized environment where the government supports it and uh, and therefore possibly it's, you know the, the demand can work but if you look at uh, from a cost standpoint is it critical to have a domestic ecosystem for uh, manufacturing of these batteries will that help how critical it is for, for us to have that so even if the cells are imported and i guess uh, they'll be still imported for at least 2 years even with niti ayog uh, pressing hard it is very good and very critical to have localized batteries because of many reasons the first one is because of the inventory carrying that if you do if you have an import batteries you have to carry 3 4 months of inventories which is wasting the life of the battery and reducing the warranty of the battery also so that is the first needs over there and also you are st- stocking batteries here there and at a dealer and in everywhere which means lots of lithium being stocked at a stationary level not being used second thing is there are so many varieties of batteries in terms of size and configurations being demanded now by the customer 
that it is impossible if you want to import to import five sizes six configurations and then couplers differently and you know, like reliance saying i want this and uh, amazon saying i want something else so it's impossible for an importer to you know give so many variety of batteries it is very easy for a local manufacturers to adapt to those changes so it is very well uh, you know understood that there has to be a pack manufacturer in india of good quality and there are now some of them coming up like exicom and sun mobility and uh, okaya etc who have started making good pack level batteries but it is very very important because then you have to understand also the bms part of it you have to understand the con- the way it is being used in the vehicle and that cannot be just fit and finish type of a battery coming from china or taiwan and put into our type of a temperature conditions it will all bugger up we have seen even uh, vehicles exploding in india now why because we are just putting batteries from outside and putting it in india we don't have mechanism of cooling properly ventilating properly so all these things means that you have to have a robust system learn from here learning cycle itself is 2 years so learn start making batteries in india by assembling batteries in india and thereafter when you get cells in india it will be a good equation for india that's good and and that leads us to the manufacturing ecosystem of uh, of the country but before i go there um uh, I would like to take some investors perspective into this uh, abhishek you are a larger you are one of the largest investors in this in the renewable space right going back a little bit and talking about renewable uh, from an investor standpoint um, you you are expecting significant growth you already own a platform which is uh, which has 650 megawatts of renewable energy for the future growth of this platform and future growth we are targeting at 450 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy how critical is the uh evolution of uh, of uh, you know battery systems storage systems in india from your standpoint second uh, also you are a global company so i would like to hear your um, your inputs on what is happening in the other parts of this world uh, in terms of storage uh, we've seen countries which are uh, very heavy uh, with the grid is very heavy on uh, renewables so how are they managing their ancillary services are is there a large usage of storage there and do we expect the same thing to happen here So thanks for uh, let me just answer your first question first uh, yes it's true that we are uh, quite uh, significantly invested in indian renewable space and we want to increase our exposure more and uh, renewable generation in india as we all know at some point of time uh, would really need um, rtc or storage and different thing than what it is now which is plain vanilla solar plain vanilla wind so we expect batteries uh, uh, to come in in a big way uh, but uh, and i've been listening to some of the other panelists here all valid points the fact of the matter is that batteries are extremely extremely expensive right and as investors um uh, we have i mean this is like a, a movie that we are seeing again right the same thing happened with solar the solar started because of government subsidies tariff to 15 rupees now that 2 and a half rupees now it's great that the tariffs are now down to 2 and a half rupees but what happened to the ppas that were signed at 7 rupees 8 rupees 5 rupees or even 4 and a half rupees like 4 and a half rupees ppas were prevalent 2 years back right and now we have uh, people who are uh, you know wanting to renegotiate that but so that is something we are extremely cautious about battery we know that right now it's expensive but it will go down as everybody believes that in the next 3 4 years will go down and once battery goes uh, price go down uh, obviously the tariffs that that developers at that point of time will be of will also go down and at that point of time what security we have for moving in the industry uh, grow and getting the batteries you know well well uh, and they are well installed in the, in the country from the beginning you know there's nothing there's no benefit there's only risk that is what i see from now the second point i want to make here is that as uh, nishit was also mentioning right now if you want and mr parimal also mentioned earlier that right now if you go for a full rtc it's extremely expensive i mean you mentioned 6 to 7 rupees my calculation so nothing below 8 that is extremely expensive except for a certain class of customers who are already paying 11 12 13 rupees but if you want to supply to those customers there is again the regulator sitting in between there is a discom sitting in between who has full flexibility to put whatever cross subsidy charges is that and they can you know uh, do whatever they can and uh, and uh, the regulatory commissions may or may not be in favor of them but that's a huge regulatory risk that's faced even to supply to customers who see value in full battery operated plants today so so 
the point i'm trying to make here is that either ways i see a lot of regulatory risk in the battery space today so unless somebody says that uh, there is a policy there is a framework in which the uh, early movers in this space will be protected legally um, it's very difficult for an investor like us to come in and at this time and i have also spoken to a few banks and lenders and they are also very 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 focused and very very excited about this space um some of the multilaterals also are very excited about this space but all of them end of the day come to the same point that right now it's expensive it will fall and when it falls then what's the guarantee that it will uh, that our contracts and our pps will be honored at that point so that's the big concern that i'm looking forward that it sort out in some time um on your other question about globally how we see uh, uh see this uh, this space growing you know there are multiple business uh, studies about uh, about stand alone batteries uh, as a merchant asset you know there are multiple case, case studies companies came companies grew some of them survived some of them didn't so there is a business model that works even if you just take a battery as an asset now if you can couple it with a grid you can couple it with a generating platform you can couple it at the customer's end but the battery platform business model is there it has been there it will continue to be there depends upon how you have the ecosystem around it and how we have the regulatory framework around it some of the countries have a great network i mean there are micro grids working on batteries uh, you know uh, hybrid uh, battery enabled micro grids prevalent and coming up in a big way in us uh, you have iot etc etc that that are expected to become extremely successful and we are seeing those some of those opportunities and we are looking at those but uh, uh we expect it's a great it's a great space so uh, we will continue to look at that very we'll carefully going forward so far uh, large scale battery installations have been few and far between this some of the other batteries have also mentioned but they have been fair, fair bit of success has been seen over there and uh, they will become uh, useful case studies to see how things go in the future but but i must say from an indian perspective the regulatory framework and the policy piece around this aspect has to be much more stronger for all industry participants not only just investors but investors lenders manufacturers developers everybody te- technology guys uh, everybody they have to see value in coming in here and putting in their time and effort and making sure that they are protected at the end of the day before things move ahead i'm going to stop there thanks so so uh, just a small uh, input here very interestingly so you said that there is uh, there needs to be legal protection for uh, for the developers who are early movers and 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 we all know that the reason one of the reasons why solar uh, prices have possibly come down is because the ecosystem developed more and more uh, demand was created and and therefore there was some economies of scale similar thing might happen here what what is your expectation from the government to protect to provide this legal protection uh what can be done it is it is going to be there in the contracts right even the pps that are being questioned today uh legally they are valid contracts they, they can't be challenged uh right um, so ultimately it will end up being a legal battle so what can the government do to prevent the situation in the future for battery storage it's an excellent point i you know if we have a solution that will be great No, so there there are positive movements on that i mean the amendments to the electricity act that have been proposed there that's a huge first step on the on the part of the government which prevent which protects entity of contract but as we know every each and every discom is up in arms against the, those amendment because for obvious reason it, it takes away flexibility from their hands and uh, puts flexibility uh, puts uh, the entire rights in the hand of a central uh, uh, central authority so they are all protect uh, up in arms against that but those kind of of uh, protections and in fact we see in the some of the recent tenders as well there are concerns like in the team generation sector that have that are coming in which protect the developers and investors to a certain extent but uh, i would i would just be very bullish about the uh, electricity act amendments that are being proposed by the central government they go a long way in addressing concerns of the investors and i would look forward to seeing them implemented and in the same in the same vein uh the government also has to has to understand that batteries are uh, a battery storage may require certain other legal protections as well because frankly i mean as a as a battery i mean it's a portable unit 
right? Why should I not be able to move that unit around depending upon the, the requirements of this? Why should I be constrained on having the asset installed as a fixed asset while it's a it's a flexible asset? You can move it around, you can use it in, in various ways. And once you, you have the flexibility of moving, what kind of, uh, uh, of business models can be done and what kind of business models can be protected from a legal point. So I would say that there are positive movements, but uh, it's a long way to go. Got it, got it. Now, at that point, I think there are a lot of discussions going on in the Electricity Act. Uh, as you rightly said, states are uh, possibly not very happy with, with some of the provisions, um, especially you know around uh, uh, taking away their powers of, uh, of uh, you know putting or appointing um, uh, commission members, etc. So yeah, hopefully I, I believe and I agree with you that uh, the electricity amendment proposals uh, provide a certain level of uh, comfort to investors and developers. And if it is impl implemented and passed in the current form, um, I think it should, it should go along with it. So that's great. I'm just changing gears a little bit and, and going into manufacturing now, right? Um, uh, we have two two large, uh, two, two manufacturers. One, um, Dr. Rashi, you are... Uh, you're already manufacturing batteries in the country, uh, and, and specifically lithium ion, if I'm not wrong. Um, how do you ski this uh, this whole space? Like, you know, we've heard all the panelists talking about, yes, there is demand, there's going to be growth, there is, you know, possibly economic viability in some uh, areas um, already. Uh, government is very bullish on it, um, you know, and I'm taking that factor out that government is bullish on it. Uh, but even if you talk about, uh, talk to the industry, they are uh, positive about it. Abhishek said that investors apart from uh, uh, the protection that they need, they are also bullish. Uh, so how do you see, one, how do you see this growth of uh, domestic manufacturing uh, in the near future? Two, uh, what are the challenges you, so far you have seen in the manufacturing space, right? I mean, it is it is not uh, simple. There are a lot of environmental issues around it, uh, sourcing of raw materials, handling of raw materials, uh, possibly, I don't know, uh, also... Uh, disposing of these batteries. So, so, what are the kinds of challenges you have seen? Also, from a talent and resource availability standpoint, right? Um, and, and what solutions do we have uh, if this needs to move forward? If we have to see a our kind of an ecosystem, uh, what needs to be done? Okay. Um, yes, I have been hearing all my esteemed panelists here, and I agree with most of the points that each one of them have said here. Uh, see, challenge, uh, we were the pioneers in India to bring uh, world's smartest lithium battery to India. So in, when I started with this, I had a tremendous amount of challenges uh, in terms of making the first in terms of making a consumer understand that what actually lithium battery is and how it is different from the conventional lead acid battery systems. That was the first challenge I faced. Uh, after that, yes, talent pooling was something which uh, was certainly a big, big challenge. And even today, it is a big challenge because uh, even though I see a lot of um, uh, training institutions coming up uh, in mushrooms around everywhere, but still the content and the quality and our academia and the institutions that we have are still not capable of um, delivering the right kind of uh, manpower that we need. So. Academy industry collaboration has to improve. Industry has to come forward uh, to, you know, handhold academia and uh, devise more and more kind of um, programs to get all these people. Because the minute we start with the domestic manufacturing in the country, we will have a big requirement of this talented pool of young uh, people that we need. And which, uh, though India has a lot of young population, but it is not trained and skilled for this particular segment as of now. So that something needs to work. Second, with the supply chain, yes, we did face difficulties and now there are certain hiccups uh, uh, at this point of time. But then I'm sure with the domestic manufacturing that the government is very pro for uh, would improve. But still, we need to improve on our sourcing. We need to understand that India... Um, but then why do we have to just you know focus only on the cell manufacturing? Definitely, cell manufacturing is very, very important. But at the same time, we have a lot of ancillary and allied things which go into a lithium battery, which can we can begin with. And by the time uh, all the sourcing and supply chain is settled, we can start with the domestic manufacturing. Is what I foresee to begin with at least having uh, a 75% made in India battery, at least made in India battery, something like that we can start with. 
I mean, I've been already doing this for like a, a five, six years now. So I know these hiccups come on the way. Another big challenge that I have also uh, observed is uh, in the cell manufacturing, most of these companies um, hide out uh, what is the environmental impact that they are doing. So we need to also understand that one side that we say that lithium batteries are very, very uh, eco-friendly and uh, they do not have any harmful substances. But at the same time, the manufacturing process needs to be evaluated thoroughly and we need to understand that we are not impacting the environment in terms of water, in terms of air and in terms of the other polluted chemical pollutants that come out. Another aspect that I think India needs to ramp up is in the ecosystem is not just... Um, the manufacturing or the um, talent pool, but even the ecosystem to uh, to you know manage any kind of firefighting or any kind of hazard that would happen coming out of these, whether it is environmental, whether it is impacting people, or whether it is impacting even the energy storage for that matter from people. I mean, a very simple example would be that uh, you know some of the parts. Of, I mean, with rooftop uh, solar, we have had these issues. Wherein the monkeys come and they destroy the panels. I mean, many a times, no matter how much protection you do, still this kind of problems keep coming up. So they even destroy the uh, wirings and the batteries and stuff around. So that is a bright possibility. So not just looking at the plain vanilla stuff. I mean, everybody needs some innovation. So India has so much of pool of talent everywhere. Can we come up with these small innovations also? I mean, this is also required. And these will give a lot of edge to our domestic manufacturing because India is very unique. We cannot have something which we are directly getting from you, uh, abroad and just put it in. It will not fit into the piece that India is. India needs customization. We need customization for everything that we get in the country. I mean, like how Gil um, sir said that, you know, uh, the temperature is a problem and on the road conditions, again, we just get thousand cycles and the customer does not want to understand what thousand cycles is. So, we need a lot of customization. We cannot have batteries right coming, you know, just directly imported and fitted in and you think everything is going to function well, that's not going to happen in India. You need a lot of customizations, you need to assess and we need the right kind of uh, talent today, which we have to develop from now on if we really want to have a sustainable and all-inclusive manufacturing ecosystem in India in the next five years at least. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. Uh, so, Rashi, what is your uh, suggestion from government policy standpoint? Right? How can we do this? Uh, and I, I agree, we need innovation, and we have the right person in the panel today to talk about innovation. And I'm going I'm to go to him next. But tell me, what is your uh, expectation and suggestion for the government to make sure that this ecosystem talent pool is available? Uh, you know, you'll be able to handle the customizations that we are talking about. Um, you know, how, how do they ensure that there is collaboration, not just between manufacturers and academicians, but also manufacturers and users today, like Mr. Gill, right, and academicians. So, you know, there is, so there is an approach which is more holistic. Uh, Mr. Gill can tell, to the, tell the manufacturers that, listen, this is the kind of customization we will need. You can tell the academicians that, uh, listen, if that is what, what the consumer needs, uh, you need to develop something that works here, right, and it is uh, economically yeah. working. So how does the government uh, do that? What is your uh, opinion on this? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe a Skill India project, that may, because Skill India projects, there are many of them, even for solar scaling and stuff. So why not we have something for uh, energy storage segment, and not just for batteries, even other energy storage segment, because each one of them in India would need, uh, again, as I said, customizations and you know tailor-made it uh, to what India needs and how the customers are going to be. So that is one thing. Second is uh, we did miss the electronics manufacturing bus and now we're trying to again jump onto it. I don't think that's going to be happening. But then uh, like how IIT uh, Mumbai has uh, developed the cell manufacturing uh, line, though it is still under uh, labs testing and we want we were looking at uh, to get commercialized. But then we need to have some program by the government which involves the manufacturers some part of the government agencies, uh, maybe IITs or ITIs or diplomas or maybe even the private universities. And you could have a one particular segment uh, of an, uh, just like how you have a course of mechatronics coming in, which has picked up recently. Something like that for storage can be devised with the industry consortium coming in. And that would really help even the um, uh, students to come up right now what another challenge that i have because i'm closely associated with many of the universities and i see the students are being fooled because they don't know things 
and they end up doing something wrong which is harmful to them also because if the battery burns or if something goes wrong there's a fire hazard or anything you will not be able to handle it with the kind of infrastructure that we have today so uh, maybe a program with completely involving industry academia and even industrial associations because it would be easier for them to implement it through them and uh, that program could help right now there are only a few private uh, players i think four or five private players who are trying to do these programs for the industry as well as academia on a small term basis but as a full time course if it comes that would help really a lot for us to develop a five year full program for domestic management excellent yeah i think uh, i hope kavita is listening i think industry associations will have a role to play uh here to to bring different kinds of industries together and and develop this ecosystem uh but uh, uh going to uh, mr kulkarni now um from sb energy you know, uh um what rashi talked about innovation that is required right we need customization in this country um you know just picking up solutions overseas and trying to use those will not work you are you are the the, the man behind innovations uh, with one of the largest institutions and investors in this world uh, tell us what kinds of innovations uh, the industry is uh, spearheading at this point in time um and uh, you know what should be our the correct uh, long term approach towards this complete battery storage ecosystem including all uh, the talent the, the raw material availability uh the the challenges that dr rashi talked about in terms of uh, you know handling a uh, hazardous material etc right what is the the right model uh, going forward yeah uh, thank you saurav and uh, you know i cannot uh, agree more to dr rashi uh, as she rightly pointed out uh, you know uh, the conditions are very different and this is not now you know right from uh, you know when uh, uh, 25 years back i started with r and d you know used to change almost you know all the products which are coming to india uh, you know at least 20 25% design changes are required to adopt to the indian conditions uh, you know specifically the ambient temperature uh, generally you know all the uh, ic rated products they are rated for 40 degrees centigrade and which doesn't work in india uh, also on the second point uh, you know on the consortium like for example you know today uh, japan has uh, come up specifically on the slp which is solid state technology you know which we will see very soon i uh, maybe in the less than you know 5 years so they form the consortium of uh, you know all the big manufacturers uh, you know auto manufacturers and the battery manufacturers from japan and they want to push this uh, you know way forward i think you know we need to do something also for you know uh, for making india uh, and uh, for the indian technology uh, what i would like to do is you know i would like to in terms of potential how big potential uh, the storage has uh i would like to correlate it uh, you know with the recent success of the telecom industry uh as you see that uh, you know there is a huge amount of investment coming in from the google and facebook in the you know telecom industry and that's actually a good example and probably you know we can learn from that industry and there is a lot of similarities uh, you know between that industry and the uh, and the storage what we are talking about so let's talk about you know they have a, a say technology layer so there are actually uh, six kind of a value streams or uh, uh, the layers first is the technology layer so where you know the mobile industry use like a arm chipset or the you know bulk up chipsets uh, in uh, uh, in storage you know we talked about you know uh, dr rahul talked about uh, you know also uh, nishit talked about it that there are so many technologies you know which are uh, spread uh, into the uh, storage space the matured one are very few when i say matured like uh, if you want if you, are, if you want to do a gigawatt hour of uh, storage uh, probably the, uh, you know only lfp nmc and uh, you know vanadium uh, and pump hydro you know maybe very few uh, which can be counted on on the other hand uh, you know the promising technologies uh, which are uh, which are kind of a commercialized but still they are not yet to the scale what is required you know kind of a, a scale what we look at and those uh, those includes you know the uh, the flow batteries basically a zinc based lot of technologies which are zinc based uh, iron flow interestingly you know the uh, iron flow technology has an uh, has an reverse main where the, if the ambient temperature goes up in fact the round trip efficiency goes up uh, but you know that's like a, a completely you know rare uh, uh, kind of a uh, you know technology uh, of course you know everyone is looking at uh, uh, solid state as a next step so that was a first layer second layer is on the telecom operator itself and now uh, you know in case of storage it will be uh, a developer and the investors you know which will form that layer 
The third layer is about the device. You know, where uh, in case of mobile operators, you know, we have uh, Samsung, uh, you know, LG, uh, iPhone. Those are the devices. While in case of uh, uh, storage, we have a uh, uh, you know uh, PCS, uh, you know, inverters, uh, all the battery manufacturers, electrical vehicle manufacturers. Those those will form that ecosystem of that equipment layer. Then if we go to the further, uh, that is called as uh, say OS, which is you know operating system. So we have all of us know, like you know, we have Android and you know iOS. Uh, in case of uh, storage, you know, we will have VMS and VMS, which is battery management system, uh, energy management system, and also uh, in case of uh, you know EV, the uh, kind of a charging, uh, uh, charging uh, you know management system. So uh, those will form the OS for the battery storage. If we go to you know one step further, which is product and services. So in case of mobile, you know, we have a lot of apps, you know, which develops, and we have you know. Uh, uh, Amazon app and you know a lot of other apps uh, which uh, uh, which works on top of it and then similar thing is going to happen with the storage also you know so many applications has been listed there is a huge variety of applications at least you know more than 50 of them uh, and each application we cannot use the same technology so for each application there has to be an unique combination of you know technology to achieve the uh, you know lowest uh, uh, LCOS so. So that uh, application layer is also very very uh, huge. So if we if we look at it like you know all the ancillary services, uh, even in future like you know vehicle to grid uh, and uh, you know peer to peer uh, connections, uh, energy trading, basically you know demand supply, all those applications are going to emerge. You know which are not uh, which are not there today, but which will you know emerge in a very large way and probably even more than uh, you know what mobile operators have today. And the last but not least, the sixth layer is the infrastructure layer, where the, you know we have telecom towers and say cloud infrastructure, you know, which which are the major infrastructure for the telecom. In in case of you know storage, also you know the grid and the uh, transmission line infrastructure will be you know play very important role. And the, the we we call like a cloud computing. Now we have to call like a grid computing. You know, after connecting so many resources to the grid, you know we need to have something you know. Very strong AI-based, uh, you know, artificial intelligence-based uh, uh, services, which will emerge, uh, which need to, uh, which we need to have to manipulate what is happening on the grid and how we can extract the right value from entire this, you know, all the six value chain, various equipments, what we have uh, installed. Uh, come to, you know, how the other technologies will impact. Like for example, you know, we. Uh, we have this, uh, you know, TV earlier. You know, many of us does not have a smart TV. Now we get just, you know, Amazon Fire Stick and it converts to the, uh, you know, smart TV. Same thing is going to happen in the entire power industry also. You know, once now this 5G uh, comes in and we have uh, a lot of reliable connection, you know, internet connection, uh, uh, all the devices will basically become an IoT devices. That means they will directly communicate to the grid. So today, if I am doing a say, you know, uh, 250 megawatt power plant. Today, there is only one connection which is communicating to the grid, but in future, all the inverters independently will communicate to the grid. All the combiner boxes will independently communicate. Same thing is with the electrical vehicle. And then this particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, change will bring us a lot of opportunity and new business model. And in fact, you know, it is so exciting to see that, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I will not be surprised that uh, this segment can pull more investment than even what telecom is pulling today. Uh, it is just a matter of time and, you know, we will be there. Very interesting, uh, Mr. Kulkarni. Um, I also hope that we don't, uh, this, this sector doesn't struggle uh, the way the telecom sector is struggling at this point in time. But uh, no point taken, uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, analogy uh, between the two sectors. Um, and you're, what you're saying, if I got it right, is that different uh, parts of this value chain will develop uh, and will possibly have uh, you know enough players and competitors in the in the market to make it economically viable and feasible right that is uh, what uh, right right see today what is happening we are working in the pockets you know the moment uh, you know as uh, you know Dr. Rashi told me for the comfort is and we look it from the ecosystem point of view then you know we will not uh, th uh, think about uh, uh, a localized uh, you know LCO then we will think India as a country, how it should grow, and then you know there may be some plus and minuses in the segments, but then overall you know the segment will grow and it will fetch a lot of investments. And uh, I will not be surprised that we will have our own uh, uh, you know technology like we are claiming now that we have our own 5G. 
we should have our own uh, you know battery technologies which is the indian make and uh, you know the investors will be you know eager to invest into that it's it's just a matter of time okay nice um so um taking a step back and talking about what uh, dr ashti also spoke about and we have um, with us uh, the possibly the only lithium potential lithium refiner in the country uh, mr kalsi um, you are getting into this ecosystem i believe you started the feasibility study uh, to set up uh, a large lithium refinery in in, in partnership with an overseas uh, company um so do you see there there are two questions that i have for you one um, what is the kind of uh, you know demand growth that you estimate of lithium itself right uh, because of the various uh, battery storage uh, applications etc um and overall from a ecosystem standpoint from the perspective of availability of materials um what is it currently what are the challenges that you see in the future and roadblocks in the growth of uh, this manufacturing and and i would also like to hear from you if if you have a perspective on how the the recycling and the reverse uh, logistics might work in the battery industry uh, because one of the key extracts from that reverse logistics would possibly be also uh, the lithium right um, and how do you decide that you will be refining lithium you will be extracting lithium from uh, from overseas markets uh, your partner will be mining it and sending it over how does the recycling industry also work for you so if you if you can give us a perspective on one how is the demand going to be looking like and uh, you know do you think there is an ecosystem beyond just sourcing a raw material which you need um, what kind of government support do you need and then how does it how does the recycling impact your uh, impact the kind of uh, you know uh, lithium refining that we're talking about here uh thank you so much saurabh i think i can, i can start with uh, saying that i agree with dr rashi and mr sohender gill about you know the need for uh, localizing uh, minerals and the and the eco chain complete ecosystem is is very critical for india as a country right now uh, uh if you talk about uh, you know uh, the, the demand for uh, lithium in, in the next 5 to 10 years i think as a uh, global adoption for uh, battery storage technologies and evs uh, grow over the next 5 to 10 years uh, demand for lithium batteries will uh, double every 5 uh, years to reach uh, an overall demand of about 2.2 million tons of uh, lc the lc is a uh, lithium carbonate equivalent uh, by about 2030 and uh, by 2030 use of lithium in terms of battery storage is forecast to grow at a compounded and annual growth rate of about 10% uh, if we talk about the overall uh, global scenario of uh, lc producing plants uh, there are 38 uh, operational plants as of now with a supply capacity of about 0.3 million tons and uh, going ahead in the future we there are plans by uh, to establish about uh, 1.3 million tons of lc by 2030 so uh, there are uh, definitely and which which comprises about 107 projects uh, uh, which are also some refineries under construction and some refineries going on in the future Planned in the future, like ours. So uh, there will always be a demand supply mismatch between. Uh, as of now, the current situation says that there's going to be a demand supply mismatch, mismatch even till 2030. So if if we do not today start investing in uh, India as a country and uh, you know corporates in the country start investing in uh, raw materials and refining and technology, I think uh, we'll be left behind by the by the other uh, countries because uh, China, as everybody knows, has taken. new steps in terms of uh, securing drills as well as setting up refineries uh, uh give an example china has about uh, 70% of the cobalt resources in the country which they have already uh, in the world uh, they have which they have already acquired uh, either directly or indirectly and uh, lithium about 89% of lithium is refined in china as of now europe and the us are also making uh, you know uh, la you know quick steps and try to catch up pretty quickly we in india as of now haven't done anything significantly uh, uh you know important to uh, move towards this uh, ecosystem but then i believe there's a company a german company called kabel which is uh, which is taking some steps and they have taken some quite some assets in australia etc also uh, the government of india has uh, you know uh, done some uh, tie-ups with companies in uh, with countries like argentina australia bolivia some mous have been signed which uh, ensure that you know indian companies and the government can uh, can uh, get access to 
critical minerals uh, in the future. Uh, also, if you talk about the current Indian uh, battery manufacturing ecosystem, it is primarily focused on assembling of batteries. Batteries are imported from countries like China, Hong Kong, and Vietnam. And uh, out of a total of about uh, 1.3 dollars in imports last year, Chinese imports were about 800 million, and Hong Kong was about 300 million, and about 100 million from Vietnam. So here also predominantly we've been, uh, you know, uh, uh, being dominated by the Chinese. Uh, globally, lithium-ion cell manufacturing, uh, uh, as I said, China, followed by US, Thailand, Germany, Sweden, Korea, they're all dominating this market as of now. The value chain, of, uh, you know, if we talk about the complete value chain uh, of uh, lithium, uh, of the of the battery uh, segment, so we talk about uh, raw material processing, uh, you know, manufacturing of separators, cathodes, electrolytes, anode cell, and finally the battery storage packs. So with India only assembling battery storage packs right now and relying on Chinese imports uh, for the rest, I think the aim should be to become uh, self-sufficient across the value chain. Uh, so I also read a, uh, an article a few days ago about India planning to import uh, some uh, tariffs on lith imported lithium-ion cells for the next 10 years and offer incentive to boost local manufacturing as part of a broader effort to you know, scale down plans and imports. I feel it is a step in the right direction, but we should also finally take steps to boost uh, domestic production, uh, which I believe the government is doing through the 50 gigawatt uh, battery manufacturing tenders. While India, you know, has a clear policy with respect to the forward integration of projects uh, and the finished product, we are yet to see a policy which, uh, you know, uh, uh, promote manufacturing of components and also critical minerals uh, like ours. So my, uh, if, you, if you, 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 when you mentioned about, you know, what, uh, you know, you're looking for uh, uh, from the government. Uh, what we want is that you know at least uh, all the critical minerals be included in whatever, whatever policies are coming out in the future. The critical minerals be included in that in those policies uh, uh, immediately. So India, uh, the, you know, Indian battery is right now relying heavily on China, which we need to slowly move away from. So having. Sorry, please, please go ahead. Just one more last point to add. So, having, you know, as I mentioned, that we're having a long term supply agreement with countries which have mines like Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, and Australia. So, it allows us to have a guaranteed supply of feedstock uh, to produce critical minerals. Uh, just to give an example, you know, I mean, the whole purpose of, uh, you know, doing, uh, uh, having a, having, moving towards EVs is to reduce the carbon footprint. So uh, if, 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 you know, uh, if you see it at this, uh, you know, uh, for example, let, let us take the example of Tesla. Tesla, uh, uh, you know, the mine is, uh, the, the material is, the, the basics, what I mean, concentrate is poured in Australia, shipped to China, refined, and then shipped to uh, uh, America, and then again, you know, put into, uh, made, made into batteries, and then shipped to ferment, ferment in uh, California to get put into cars. So there's a huge carbon footprint, which we ultimately think we, which we need to reduce. Uh, and if we, the sources of your uh, materials are closer to the end consumers, that footprint goes down, and the whole purpose of you know uh, doing this uh, getting uh, electric gets resolved. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, we have we have a couple of more minutes. Uh, uh, just me. I also want to understand how will the reverse logistics, the the recycling, the, the second use, etc. How will that uh, work? Do we have the right, um, you know, supply chain set up, the logistics set up to make that happen? Uh, because the disposal and the second use will be critical from this industry standpoint, right? And how does it specifically impact the, the refining aspect of uh, lithium? Because you may be able to extract something from the from the disposed batteries, right? Right. So uh, I, there are already a few companies in India, Batero, uh, Zip Tracks, who have you know heard of who run to. Uh, into the refining of, uh, into recycling of uh, lithium-ion batteries, and they're doing a pretty good job at it. Also, I must say, uh, especially Ataro, I had a word with, the, with them a few days ago, and I, I came to know they're doing a pretty nice good job. So, uh, see, uh, recycling today is about 20% of the total, uh, you know, disposed battery worldwide. That is the benchmark uh, for recycling to recycling to uh, slowly increase. I think that will be beneficial for countries like India. Urban mining is what we call it. If at all, uh, you know, we are able to increase the 20% to 30, 40, 50%, definitely it is going to help the country. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, what effect will it have on our lithium refinery? Definitely the cost for, you know, recycling and the cost for 
producing it new should not be uh, you know too too different from too uh, uh, i mean uh, the difference in should not be too much uh, we we will we are targeting a cost of under $10000 per lithium uh, per ton of lithium hydroxide and i believe uh, recycling also is about 7 to $8000 so the differential is not pretty uh, pretty high plus you know uh, uh, the the recovery from uh, recycled material is also uh, the quality of the recycled material is also pretty good so i don't see a challenge there i in fact i see an opportunity along with the lithium refinery which we are putting i think uh, recycling should be encouraged and uh, definitely there is a draft policy which is there already there and uh, if uh, recycling is encouraged i'm sure india can uh, and the uh, you know rare <coughs> or import of uh, uh, materials from outside have to be a little uh, tweaked a little little so that you know imports are allowed freely so we can import uh, you know if india doesn't have sufficient raw material to give its uh, recyclers we can import some from outside and then do it here and then uh, you know meet the demand local demand sarab yeah very interesting uh, yeah you know, i'm just uh, wrapping up i think uh, i think mr rock mr rash dr rashi yeah. uh, you know wants to uh, add to this uh, please mr so on the uh, on the uh, second life i'd like to add see most of these uh, ev batteries are now to come out and you can use them for a non critical uh, stationary application that would help us to still prolong the recycling and india should not only look at only domestic manufacturing of cells but at the same time we have to start a a business model and an infrastructure for recycling because whatever is being manufactured outside we have the potential to recycle it so we could eventually be in a ecosystem where we can balance out the need that we in the country have also cater to the people abroad so focusing not just on cell manufacturing but even recycling infrastructure would be very helpful that's great um so that's great i think we had a very uh, uh, good discussion here gentlemen ladies i think uh, you know my take away from the key take away from this discussion is that i'm feeling at you know lot more positive about this industry um you know the demand seems to be there uh, in fact uh, very heartening to hear that off grid applications are also finding a lot of demand and and uh, use um, you know, not just the large scale grid application um it's you know uh, dr walworkers uh, uh, inputs in terms of actually we are reaching towards uh, um, you know low cost uh, applications and in some applications we are possibly economically feasible there are areas like ev etc like mr dale mentioned we we may need more government intervention before this can become completely uh, you know the the large scale adoption can go there some bit of consumer awareness etc some bit of financial instruments and and structuring may be uh, helpful but i think there is there is some positive uh, you know uh, progress there hopefully government will look at this uh, in a more positive uh, light um, uh, it's also interesting to note that various technologies will possibly evolve and move together uh and different applications will use different technologies um, you know hopefully at some point in time all of them become uh, will become cost effective and and useful um and and lastly the investors perspective on uh, uh, on how to protect investment uh, in the future and not not go down to the path that we have already you know seen in in some other areas uh, so i think we uh, collectively as a government uh, you know uh, and as an association maybe as cham can play a role to provide some of these inputs um, Uh, to the government and and see how we can take it forward but uh, thank you everyone um, kavita over to you please yeah am i audible uh, sarat yes yes okay as we come to the end of this uh, 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 webinar uh, i would like to on behalf of asocham would like to express heartfelt gratitude and sincere thanks to all the panelists for their intellectual contribution to this uh, thought process and of course i would like to pay uh, special thanks to sarab and jayant ji for joining us and moderating this session um, in fact uh, we can assure you that asocham will uh, proactively work on this and uh, um, you can expect all the uh, possible um, uh, support from asocham in taking each and every recommendation that you have taken Uh, you have expressed we will take it to the government we will pursue aggressively with the government and we'll see how we can uh, position this at uh, a strong platform for uh, energy uh, storage battery technologies um, sarab uh, i would request all the panelists in case if they could share 
their uh, brief uh, representations with us, which we will collate and uh, uh, we will send our representation finally to the government. I would at the end also like to thank all the participants who have been listening to this and in case if they have their inputs, they can also share it with Asucham at the email id kavita.sharma at asucham.com. Uh, I, at the end, thank everyone uh, once again for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.